Thank you, Mark. And thank you, uh, panelists, for joining. And thanks for making it happen. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Asher Abraham. I'm uh, excited to dive into a discussion near and dear to my heart uh, about Israeli innovation and the ecosystem. As a quick intro, um, I was born and raised in Israel. I live in Israel. I manage with our capital partners. We focus on tech and VC investments across stages and sectors. I'm a FINRA member representing Stonehaven LLC, the broker dealer here in Israel. Um, so as I said, born in Israel, worked with many Israeli companies over the years. Um, most of my career actually, I lived in New York for 12 years. So I'm, uh, I've got the perspective of an American living here. Uh, I studied finance. I began my career um, in New York as a distribution. I, I led distribution for a consumer products company, worked at Liberty Mutual for a while. Um, and got into the tech and VC scene about eight years ago. I live in Zichron Yaakov, which is an hour north of Tel Aviv on the coast, a beautiful wine, wine uh, region. And I live, uh, and my, I have uh, three kids here, and um, I have a um, pretty good understanding based on the experience that I've worked with so many different entrepreneurs and VCs uh, of what really makes it makes this uh, innovation ecosystem tick um, over the last uh, let's say eight years I've been involved with uh, over 200 companies fundraising and um, creating district partnerships strategic partnerships around the world um, I had the good fortune of, of working with uh, one of the leading venture capitalists John Medved who's um, started one of the earlier funds in the 90s I was working with him for about uh, six years and also with several uh, entrepreneurs. So the nice thing about Israel is that, you know, whether you're talking about saving, you know, lives with uh, autonomous uh, cars or advanced cancer research, uh, cybersecurity for protecting data or optimizing natural crops and, and, and ag tech, ultimately, the Israeli culture has been focused on challenging the status quo and uh, and the spirit that's driven by solving world problems and advancing solution solution in, in using technology. So it really is coming from a place of impact at scale uh, with scientific advancement. And like everyone else, you know, Israeli companies are now facing the down market and on the backdrop of, of a flourishing eco ecosystem over the last several years. I mean, last year, if you can see the, the slide, um, we had a breaking record year with Israeli companies raising $25 billion and around 23 billion in exits. Just last week, um, there was, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like it's really slowing down. Uh, there's a newsletter that, uh, that I received from, uh, from a known growth stage investor here, Greenfield Partners. They have a newsletter that summarizes weekly deals. And uh, they reported $170 million raised just last week with uh, bringing the total amount for the year at $10 billion. And my LinkedIn uh, feed is full of deals. People are announcing funds and, and new deals right and left. So there's definitely still a tremendous amount of activity just new challenges and new opportunities being that we're all facing. And I think Israel has a unique uh, opportunity and, and uh, you know, the changing of priorities, changing of strategies. Uh, there's a lot, a lot to be discussed. So um, this conversation will explore what, you know, what Israel, where we go from here in Israel and uh, more importantly, what are the specific challenges and opportunities that lie ahead? Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to uh, Moshe Friedman. He's the uh, head of venture uh, at Amdocs. He's, he's a seasoned venture capitalist for 25 years. I'll let him introduce himself. Um, so please, Moshe, please take it away. Thanks, Asher. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I work for uh, Amdocs. Those of you who know or don't know Amdocs, Amdocs is the largest software business in Israel. Uh, with a little bit over a $10 billion market cap, 30,000 employees, of which 10,000 are developers, serving uh, the largest telecommunication media uh, 
and cable businesses uh, throughout the world. I founded and run their uh, venture team. Uh, a little bit uh, about my, um, my background and uh, what we look for, uh, I'll, I'll try to do both. So uh, in terms of my background, I was actually born and bred in Brooklyn. I like to say I was born in Brooklyn before, uh, before Bernie Sanders made it cool. And so this is the, uh, you know, your parents' Brooklyn, if you will. Um, and uh, ended up uh, in Princeton, in Jersey, uh, studying under Ben Bernanke, who became, you know, the head of the Fed, and Paul Krugman. Uh, went down to Baltimore for, uh, for five years at a firm called Alex Brown that became Deutsche Bank. For those of you who know it, Alex Brown is one of the tech-focused banks. Uh, there, I started to get to know the Israeli ecosystem. I was actually uh, responsible for raising capital for private businesses in Israel from 1998 to 2003, a kind of the Israeli startup ecosystem, you know, 0 0.5 is what I like to call it. Um, then I moved up to New York, worked for a firm called Broadview, which became Jefferies, moved to Israel, uh, didn't want to be a banker here, actually wanted to get my hands dirty and uh, you know, with startups became the VP product strategy and VP marketing for a software business uh, that focused on healthcare IT that we sold to uh, TPG. Um, then I joined Amdocs, who was actually a client of mine when I was, uh, when I was uh, at uh, Deutsche Bank and at Jefferies. Uh, I ran product M&A for them for three years, buying companies. And for the past four years, I've been running our venture team. Um, a little bit about what we do in the venture team. We are, we're a business independent fund about a 50% IRR on track to return about four to six times our capital. We actually don't invest in things that Amdocs knows. We, we invest what we call it the horizon of our strategy in enterprise IT that is big enough to move the needle for large enterprises uh, all over the world. So we, we, kind of, we like to invest in, we call swinging for the fence uh, companies, companies that really can change, make a dent in the universe. Uh, and when we say the universe, we talk about the enterprise IT universe, so a little piece of the universe. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what, what uh, you know, why, as a global business, why we focus specifically on Israeli business, on Israeli companies. Why we were very long Israel. When you look at um, the country, it's kind of amazing. It is the most efficient place in the world to build big big private businesses. You know, we're using the word unicorns these days, but it's really arbitrary. You can really set the pin wherever you want to set it. And Israel will outperform in terms of its ability to create large venture-backed businesses. When you look at you know, unicorns per capita, um, you know, we, we use the, the, the 10 million number here because that's, that happens to be the Israeli population, it's 10 million. And then we, we, we um, uh, right-sized everything else to that. There are about 10 times, there's, there's about 100 um, Israeli unicorns, a little bit less than 100 Israeli unicorns. Uh, that's about 10x on a per capita basis what you have in the United States and about 45 times, 47 to be exact, what you have in Western Europe and the numbers just trail off from there, which is kind of, a, which, which is, you know, it's clearly, it's not as big in absolute numbers, but on a per capita basis, it way outpaces other parts of the world. And, and it really begs the question why, which we'll get to in the next slide. Well, when you look at it, it's not just that there are more uh, on a per capita, 9% of the global unicorns are from Israel, even though it only makes up 0.1% of the population. That means that we're punching you know, 90X above our weight uh, on, a, on an average basis all over the world. Um, and we're doing it with less money. So we're doing it, uh, you know, uh, even though about 10% of the unicorns were Israeli, only 3% of the funding actually went to Israel to build those unicorns. So it's, so it's, it's a very fertile land uh, to, to build businesses. And the question is, okay, you know, what's, you know, why? So if we, if we can move, move one slide forward. So, some of the reasons are good and some of them aren't that, that 
that good, but it is what it is. Uh, so, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very happy to open this up uh, to others to hear what they have to uh, say. I mean, this comes from, you know, the 24 years of, of working in this ecosystem, uh, but being very familiar with the United States ecosystem, being, you know, born and bred in the United States. So first of all is the mandatory army service. Uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, mandatory is a strong word. It ends up being, I think about 50 or 60% of people, but it's on paper, at least mandatory. Uh, the, 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 really the kids, my, my kids are, are, are among those kids. The kids that come out of this, uh, of the army in Israel, of the armed forces, uh, especially the ones that are uh, put in a position to lead teams, and even more than that, those that lead technology teams are forced early on in their life to, uh, to take uh, really tough decisions, lead their peers, uh, build teams, and probably most important, make decisions, right? They're forced to make decisions with imperfect information in a very time-constrained environment, uh, which positions them very well uh, to lead businesses. It also positions them very poorly to follow others sometimes. Uh, so you'll always, you'll, you'll see that well, one, of the, one of the bad, the flip side of this is that everyone wants to be a CEO in this realm. So it's good for company formation. Sometimes it's bad for a company for talent retention. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but it's really good for, for um, really building a very um, deep, young talent pool early. The, the second, and this is, you know, the, the second piece that I want to raise for uh, the secret sauce for how Israel does it is that there are excellent technical and engineering programs in Israel and very weak social science and liberal arts programs. As someone who's who studied, you know, social sciences in, in, you know, in the university in New Jersey, it's really hard to explain to my kids what I study. Like, why would you study literature, dad? You know, why would you study economics, uh, dad? Why not study something that you can actually use in life. So that becomes a conversation about how do you use it or not. But the honest truth is that the smart uh, folks who are applying to university in Israel uh, apply to technical enge and, and engineering programs and not to social science programs because they're much, much uh, more challenging and more prestigious. The third, also, you know, good news and bad news. There is a striking lack of comparably paid service economy jobs in Israel. It's really hard to make, uh, you know, to become a, a doctor in Israel. You, you'd think a country of, you know, Jewish mothers, everyone would be a doctor and a lawyer. It's actually really hard to be a doctor in Israel. Um, yeah, and then when you are a doctor, you're not you're not making nearly. You know, my, my wife's a doctor. She makes here in shekels what she made in dollars. In America, so it's a very different pay scale. Same goes for legal profession, for accounting. So there's a there's a, there's a striking lack of comparably paid service economy jobs, which means that the brightest go to technology. The the fourth reason that we can put our finger on is uh, relative population density and cultural openness. We we live pretty close together, and we're all really. Well, not all of us, but the, the, the level of openness is striking for folks who have met, who have met Israelis or visited Israel. You can, you can walk up to most people on the street and ask personal questions. So it was a little bit jarring um, for, for me when I first joined. And then I see a question from Jeremy, which I'm going to get to right now, is the fifth, which is the easily accessible non-recourse government funding programs that offer non-dilutive seed capital. So it's a kind of equity capital, it's, it's non-recourse. And so you don't need to pay it back if you, if you, if you fail. Um, and, but it's, it's non-dilutive. So it doesn't sit on your, on your equity capital table. 
and that and it's really available, right? It's it's easier to get that capital than to get venture capital in Israel. Uh, so that these five elements, uh, there are more, but you know, like as an example, it's the company the the country is extremely forgiving from a tax perspective to VCs. Uh, there's, it's one of the only countries in the world with its own tax regime for venture capital to make venture capital tax efficient, to bring capital into the country. So it's, it's you know, there, there are, the stars aligned in a lot of different ways over the past 15 years in Israel, uh, past 20 years. Um, the first VCs were actually funded by the government. So they weren't even you know, the companies that were being funded, but the VCs themselves were being funded, which is something that is almost, is almost ridiculous when you think about it in the, in the, in the sense of, of the United States. Uh, you know, obviously you have SBIC and you have a, a lot of programs in the United States, but it's nowhere near as um, fruitful an environment. Literally kids, you know, grow up reading the newspaper about exits more than they read newspapers about you know, baseball heroes or soccer heroes here. Uh, so it's, you know, the technology industry has become a bit of, you know, has benefited from, from strong uh, cultural dynamics, strong educational dynamics, and a, a positive, um, you know, a, you know, the good side of having a standing army. Uh, you know, there are a lot of bad sides to it, but the good side of having a standing army with a very high technical quotient is, constant flow of talent. We'll talk a little bit about challenges, but I'll, I'll pause for a minute. I was promised that this is gonna be interactive. So I'll pause for a minute and take questions before we go into some thoughts on challenges and opportunities going forward. So we have a, a question about uh, regulatory frame, you know, framework in Israel, but uh, we'll get back to that, I think at the end. I wanted to, Moshe, can you speak a little bit about Israeli entrepreneurs' approach to risk and how it might be different uh, in nature from, let's say, U.S. Uh, just how how they approach risk and 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 risk taking and failure. Sure. sure. So uh, there's a there's you know it's the, it's the science of single instances to a certain degree. So I don't want to be so I, well. I'll I'll be I'll be speaking mostly from my experiences. And I'm sure that others will have will have other experiences, uh, but I, I would say that that there is a um, a very strong position in Israel of leading from within, which means that a CEO will lead their company, but very much see himself as part of the company, not as apart from the company. So, and what that translates into is, uh, to a certain extent, there'll be some level of um, conservatism, you know, a, a lack of risk taking when it comes to putting a company at risk, because people will view part of the raison d'être of a company to provide uh, for the families of those who are employed. It's a very strong, it's called family work ethic. When you come to work in Israel, uh, that part of, it's almost like what reminds me a little bit about the ESG uh, wave that is overtaking a lot of, you know, capital markets these days. There's a very strong bottom line, what I would call another bottom line in Israel relative to making sure that people are paid a decent wage and that those wages are not at risk. And if God forbid the company goes under that those people are taken care of. Uh, I used to be when I was in m and anyone that we had to let go to make a business case work, we went to work for them, with them, to find them job, other jobs in our, in our company, uh, just as an example. But that, that's true throughout. So that's on one hand from a, that influences, I would say, um, risk-taking to be conservative because there's a value in the company uh, succeeding that goes beyond just the, the shareholders' value, frankly, the employer and the employee's value. On the other side, from a risk-taking perspective, there's what I would call a comfort with risk. I would say uh, CEOs and generally boards in Israel lean into risk in a way that they feel that 
especially in the startup ecosystem, that you have risk capital, that you've been given capital to take those risks. Not taking the risk is a misuse of the capital. Now, it's you need to take smart risks, but the fact that you're going to take a risk is taken for granted, right? So, and then the question is, okay, how do I mitigate that risk and make sure that my chances for success are as high as possible? And that for that, it's everyone's on debt. You know, I can tell you as a, as a, as a Brooklyn kid coming to Israel, the amount of hours spent into the wee hours of the night and the early hours of the morning going through scenario planning, which is straight out of the army, right? What's gonna happen if, what's our response if, so that you build this muscle memory that enables not just smart risk-taking, but a quick reaction time to, to untold numbers of scenarios. I think uh, when coupled with a very strong family work ethic that I, in my view, really, enables and really recruits uh, you know the 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 rank and file of every company to be all hands on deck because everyone knows that they're watching for you they're watching out for you they're not going to let you they're not going to let you go unless they really really have to and you're going to do everything you can to make sure it succeeds so it's a very much an us as opposed to you and them uh scenario and a very thoughtful uh view of risk taking but mandatory risk taking in order to succeed. And you, you address the government funding programs, but in, as we all know here in Israel, the, the government is, is uh, going through a change. Uh, do you expect change po in political uh, leaders to impact the support of our government programs? Yeah, I think the biggest issue is frankly a lack of a budget. So if, for those who know the Israeli political system, um, the way that it the way that, that it works here is that the budget making process is a key milestone uh, and can only be done with a sitting government that has, you know, not as opposed to a transitory government. Uh, so uh, until you know, so that's the risk. The risk is more budgetary. There's broad consensus, broad consensus that this is uh, one of the brightest spots in the Israeli economy. Uh, I, you know, I heard recently that there's a goal for a million out of the 10 million people in Israel to be working in high tech and 10 million people, but remember like 3 million are, ch are children, right? So assuming right. we're not going to violate child labor laws, but you're talking one out of every seven adults, right? You, you have to assume that I think the actual workforce participation is somewhere usually around 60%. So just to put things in perspective, you're, you're talking of adults, right? You're talking about one out of every three working in this industry. So everyone is focused on the benefits of this industry. I hate, I hate to use a Reaganomics word, but trickling down mm -hmm. into other parts of the, of the economy. So it's become broad consensus that, that uh, what works will stay. Uh, if anything, the question is how to make it even better. Asher, I'm just mindful of timing. You wanna we're, I think we're, we've gone over time. Yeah, so we'll let's uh, move on to, uh, to Alicia. Alicia, I, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Lisa is a senior partner at, at Catalyst Investments, one of the probably the earliest venture fund uh, in Israel. Uh, so, Alicia. Hello, everyone. Good good morning, first of all, to you. What the energy, Moshe. Thank you. I saw when I heard about uh, how you were explaining about Israel. So I'm really glad that I moved to Israel, uh, which was 11 years ago, by the way. Uh, so I just came back from New York, and I'm really happy to be again, even through Zoom, together with you. So uh, open that for any uh, interactive questions. Please just stop me in the middle if you want to. So my name is Lysia. Uh, I am born in Istanbul, in Turkey. My background is mechanical engineering. I'm a master of science of mechanical engineering. And I was living in Europe for about uh, 10 years. I, there's a great music time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was working in the automotive industry for BMW and Martin Steyer. So uh, practically, didn't uh, think about that to come to Israel. 
So what it happened when I came that 11 years ago to in Israel, I was sitting in a coffee house in the Tel Aviv and literally uh, you are sitting in the 15 kilometers and the whole Tel Aviv, it's full of the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and investors. So uh, I came for one year and I never went back to Europe. So that was, I think, one of the best decisions that I took that in my life. And uh, I jumped to the agro industry because I wanted to know that how the Israel is that the agro industry and the food tech industry has impacted so dramatically this country that we are today looking that to another Israel, which was that 50, 60 years ago was completely different. So I worked in, I jumped into the financial life, which was that Adama, today the biggest agro company in Israel, which has been that acquired by Camp China by $2.6 billion. And I spent actually uh, mainly my time in America, uh, even I needed to pay tax in America. So I came for one year to Boston. I lived at also in Boston. I came back and uh, did another acquisition, which was the Qatar Group, acquired by $1.7 billion by BC Partners. So BC Partners was the private equity still in the UK. So I was working that very actively in UK. And uh, since I jumped from the sell side to the buy side, uh, I, I knew that, that I wanted to be that in the venture capital. And I'm lucky I joined four years ago, Catalyst Funds. Uh, Catalyst Funds today is existing over 23 years in Israel. Actually, when Moshe told that this is the first fund that has been that uh, supported by the um, governmental, that's true. At that time, uh, from that time, there are only four VCs in Israel that remained over 20 years. And uh, luckily, we are one of them. Today, I am investing along my partners. We are investing in growth late stage high tech companies and um, happy to welcome you anytime that you are coming. And we are also very often in States. Uh, simple reason, I tell you why we are in the States very often, Israel is very small. So any business plan of the entrepreneurs that are coming to us, mostly and mostly their business plan starts from the US market. So any companies that I am investing together with my partners is 55% is that headquartered in States and the rest in Europe. So Israel is so small, and this is why actually there is an advantage and disadvantage, but specifically today, uh, we cannot talk on a pink board because uh, there is a crisis. We see that the public market, we see the private market, and uh, I'm happy to get more questions about that. I just talk a lot about in uh, Miami and in New York about this, how the companies are impacted current by the current crisis. And the one of the biggest advantage uh, that we see that today in Israel, not the Israeli companies are better if you can go one slide back, so that will be good, thank you. Not Israeli companies are better than, one slide back, please. Lisa, I'm just mindful oh. of time, if you could uh, keep it going, but keep going. Okay. Um, the, not the Israeli companies are better than the US companies. It is only what uh, Israeli companies are that good at on the m and part. So this is actually, one of the uh, biggest added value currently what is happening that in the market, the IPO was that not common for the Israeli companies. It only happened more and more that we are seeing that today more unicorns and they went that uh, to the NASDAQ in the USA. And my, also we have four companies that went that to the NASDAQ, but this happened that because of the sparks and because of that, uh, what it's happened that during the last two years, three years. Look two years before and now, now what is happening during the last six months, it's the MNAs are happening more and more. And I think this is that what it makes that specifically that to, to bring a great advantage that to the Israeli high tech companies, that they know that have to be acquired and also to manage that the post-merger integration and integration that the company can keep the R&D center still here and operate it. 
So when we are looking at the inflation rates that in Israel is much lower compared to states, we see that. So it is a great advantage in terms of that Israeli high tech companies. So um, in light of the timing, because uh, Mark also said, so I do not need to go that over the next slides. It's okay. So happy then no, to get any questions. Please, please touch on them. I just wanted to make sure that we got, uh, yes, let's just touch on, on them a little bit if you don't mind, Lisa. Uh, okay, so uh, actually that my uh, Moshe has that uh, touched at many points, but maybe one thing that I could add, it is that a melting pot of the immigrants. So you see that in this 15 kilometer uh, that from the 90 countries across the world, different cultures. So in my family, just the three, four languages are spoken. My husband came that from France. It gives that a lot of flexibility that to bring from different cultures the differences. And today, what is making that the startup company, of course, we have that we want to make a better impact, which is that written in our religion, what is called the Tikkun Olam. Of course, we have the chutzpah, which means that daring to do that. But the most important and the beauty is that the diversity is coming that, and you will see in every single Israeli startup company. You will see that many Ukrainians are working along with the Russians, along that with the uh, German people. And this is the reason actually, they also can adapt that their business plans from day one. They don't have any other chance. So they need to go global uh, from day one. So that gives it a greater advantage that to the Israeli high-tech companies. So that's my side uh, and uh, happy that uh, to get uh, any questions. In terms of that investments, maybe that one thing that I would like to add. So we see that a shift in the sectors that we are investing. So I am investing in diversified sectors, which means investing in FinTech, investing in cybersecurity, which is the hard core of Israel. Over 1,000 companies out of 9,000 is coming only from cybersecurity because this is what we learned, what is the high tech. So we didn't know the definition of the high tech, even the governmental funds, they didn't know where to invest unless we learned that what we have, it is called cybersecurity. So we invest in the advertisement technology, smart mobility, and I'm sure that you have heard the biggest exit in Israel still today, a mobile by $15.3 billion by Intel. And we are the only VC that has invested. So the sensors, the data analytics are very, very important. But what we see that the change in terms of the sector also linked to the market situation is that where the, peop the need of the people. So you, we might all have the money, but at the end of the day, you need to have that food on your uh, plate. So the agro tech and the food tech is playing that much, much bigger role compared that a uh, couple of years ago. Or the buzzword that we are using that today ESG, actually because of that, what is happening that the governmental sport specifically that in Europe, it's happening. We are investing more and more in energy companies. So we can discuss that advantages, disadvantages, but it is happening. So two of the companies that we have invested just during the last six months, it is that energy related. Lisa, maybe we'll open it up for questions now, but, but I could listen to you sure. all day. Sure. So one question that uh, I wanted to ask both of you is how is how is your portfolio responding to the market dip? What are specific things that a company is doing in your portfolio to uh, overcome this, this change in market? Um, sure. So in, in terms of the, the crisis, so our company it went, uh, since it is existing over 23 years, it went over two crises, .com and the 2008 crisis. So practically uh, during the crisis time, as also Moshe said that before, we are very good uh, to make that the plan. So in terms of the portfolio companies, we made sure that each and every single portfolio companies that we have invested in Catalyst, they have a runway between 18 months to three years. So which gives them already a flexibility to focus on the strategy rather than every day on the fundraising time. Now, there is, there is a, it is a challenging time. The valuations are going down, many things are happening, but 
if you use that this time efficiently, that could be that in a great advantage specifically for the growth stage companies, because the growth stage companies has already proven that their revenue have already received that the trust from the customers. So they only need to continue with the uh, trust they have received from the customers and continue that with the developing and increasing their revenue. Because when it's time comes in one and a half year, they will be that in a better, much more uh, uh, better situation than compared to the companies, they still need to prove their product. They still need to prove that, uh, to gain that the trust of the customers. So uh, we are working that very, very closely currently very close it means that even though we are on the board every week we are or sometimes every second week we are meeting with the companies and we are looking there from every perspective r and d height and uh, the technology the customers how we can support along our network and also from the technology perspective so, so real, real brief uh what are what are some first of all I, I i i'm not calling it a crisis i don't think it's a crisis i think uh to be clear um we have to divorce between operate operating metrics and capital markets metrics we're here to build businesses not not to sell stock uh, so we don't view it as a crisis we think it's it's good news uh that that valuations have become uh reasonable again and when you look back in time, it's really the past two years, I would argue, were a crisis, not, not now, mm -hmm. uh, because it created, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, sure. created, it created un an unfortunate focus and money was cheap, so people took money, but that's not the way the money should be. So uh, we're, we're, you know, we're working with our companies as we always work with our companies to make sure that they're positioned to grow and that they're you know, bat battling, you know, fighting the good fight every day to, to grow their business. So I, I, I not much it's, change. It, absolutely nothing, actually. Okay, good to hear. Yeah, a lot of VCs are saying that this is a good thing. We need to go back to, uh, you know, reality uh, and not inflate companies with valuations that are not deserved. So I, I, I hear your point. Um, We'll continue the questions uh, during the breakout. So I want to move on to uh, the companies that are on the panel. Uh, first, uh, we'll hear from Amir. Amir is CMO for EFA Technologies. EFA is an incredible blood diagnostics uh, technology that uh, brings the lab to the patient uh, for the most popular blood tests. You'll hear more from Amir. So Amir, are you ready? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much, Asha. Uh, well, excited to be here, actually from the, from the side of the entrepreneurs. And well, I, I've been uh, with cutting edge technologies since the early, early 80s. So it's for quite a while, since my early days in the Israeli, Israeli Air Force. And I've been uh, myself an entrepreneur for over 30, 30 odd years. Uh, developing um, developing uh, cutting edge te technologies in satellite communication, in image processing, in uh, cybersecurity, and uh, I have I have been even uh, an entrepreneur in South Africa, which is actually double risk, you know. So to live in South Africa and being an entrepreneur, both of them quite uh, quite uh, quite challenging, and bringing uh, a lot of Israeli technologies to uh, to different markets, and over the years. I've developed a very, uh, very broad and powerful network of uh, uh, technology partners and uh, distribution partners, uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 so on. Now we we uh, in EFA Technologies we actually in a in a field of the of the health tech or more specifically in uh, in uh, medical devices. But we we kind of like wrote on our on our mission statement that we would like to bring an, an affordable and lab quality type of diagnostics uh, to anyone. And uh, by anyone, I mean like practically anyone, anywhere. And, uh, and because of that, we, we developed uh, this, uh, this uh, portable, completely mobile device that is able to, uh, to deploy multi-channels, multi-applications, multi-clinical applications, and to, to give a better decision support 
right uh, right at the bedside and the bedside can be anywhere it can be at the hospital the clinic or actually at at, uh, uh, at home where the patient uh, where the patient is <clears throat> we 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 started uh, we started the, this uh, this venture and uh, Moshe spoke about it uh, before we started based on on grants that we got from the from the Israeli innovation authority and we're actually to date, we, we received, I would say, all possible grants that uh, they would give to a company like us through the different stages of our, of our growth, from the ideation all the way to now we, uh, we are ready to market and we're going into production and they even gave us a special grant for that. And uh, we're, very, we've, we're very proud of that because it's a substantial amount of investment. It is not, uh, not dilutive. And obviously, we uh, we also um, uh, raised money from uh, from private investors, and now we're going into the uh, into the round A uh, uh, to raise uh, to raise more money to meet uh, to meet the markets and our and our targets. Um, it's um, it's very it's very important to emphasize. You know we. We're doing that uh, in Israel, where we have access to human capital and brain power, which is uh, really nothing to nothing to compare. And uh, I've been I've been uh, around the world, you know, and it's right right next to you. So we we also um, approach the universities and the tech tech institutions like the Technion and so on, and we pick uh, we pick and choose the the top. The top students right at the end of the uh, of the studies and uh, through um, internship and so on. Later on, we we'll just we bring them into uh, into our company. Whether they're going to be engineers and uh, and later on, later on uh, also even uh, even PhDs. And we 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 have uh, we're very proud on the on the teams that we that we build, and that's uh, that's. I would say pretty much like just because where we uh, where where we are. So so that particular that particular solution of ours has got even more <clears throat> strong uh, strong needs and uh, assurances during the during the COVID pandemic because we we realized even more how important it is to uh, to provide technologies to meet uh, to meet the challenges in case management and point of care and to make sure that the patient journey and the patient experience is going to be um it's going to be different yeah? not to not to bring them to to centralized type of locations where they might be contracting uh, uh, more you know more diseases and other and other issues. Um, so so yeah, so this is this is basically what uh, what what uh, what we do, and we're proud to be very much on the you know with the support of the ecosystem over here and the partnership that we have with leading health organizations in this country like uh, like Maccabi and leading hospitals like uh, like Rambam and Shiba and Asuta and all of them are very much like partners uh, with us and some of them are even uh, investors actually equity investors in our in our company so obviously Israel's been great to you for founding the company and getting to where you are do you find that there's challenges in being in Israel when you're trying to build and sell product to global market Oh, uh, we, you know, it's uh, at, at the end of the day when you when you meet the when you meet other markets, then uh, then you have to prove that it actually that it actually works. It doesn't it doesn't help that you just say that you you come from from a country with a lot of uh, technology and you have good ideas and everything. At the end of the day, you'll be judged by the merits of what you what you what you provide. Um, the, the the challenges are always, um, you know, resources when you get to, for instance, the U.S., then you have a lot of uh, skepticism, especially in our in our field, because there were a lot of uh, world renowned debacles about uh, diagnostics and, and so on. So we have to prove otherwise. But uh, but people 
people listen to us because most of them like uh, Israeli technology. They 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 think it's a, it's a, it's got brilliant ideas and uh, and so on. Um, so we get the order the, the the doors opened quite quite comfortably to listen to us. So it's uh, it's very important. You find that <clears throat> do you find that um, building a team and building you know and doing R and D in Israel? A lot of people talk about the talent shortage. Um, is that is that a challenge that you're facing in Israel in, in, in building your team or? You know, there, there was uh, there was like not long ago, obviously, that uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of shortage because uh, companies with very deep pockets used to uh, just offer some ridiculous packages to some to some people, especially in the in the IT industry, in IT industry, especially in the software design and and, and all these areas. In our in our field, uh, bioengineers uh and uh, medical engineers and uh, mathematicians and physicians th those are the people that we mostly mostly use we we, we find we find the talent uh, the talent uh, quite quite uh, quite comfortably i would say um i can understand what's what's going to happen now is like you know things are changing a little bit with uh, the ecosystem but uh, we can find more talented people with more affordable affordable salaries now, but uh, yeah, I just read it on Calcalist uh, today an article that I shared with uh, with you all. I don't know if you saw it that uh, a lot of the multinational companies are slowing down on their recruiting, which will create more of a talent pool for the startups because that was always difficult to compete with big multinationals. Absolutely, so that would be a good thing. Um, what any any thoughts about? Uh, what makes unique makes Israeli companies, or or especially in healthcare, uh, the, the the research, the the, the science uh, focus. Uh, what 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 would you attribute the the healthcare innovation success to in Israel? I think I think that uh, it was it was said earlier that we we don't we don't really take no for an answer. Even if we if we fail in one particular avenue, we 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 very much. Uh, don't distract from that. You know, we actually go go back to the to the drawing board. We 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 very much uh, uh, risk uh, risk of us. We know we 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 like to test everything from all uh, from from all aspects. We we're very creative, and we we think that uh, um, being in this type of environment, it's uh, it's good. It's good to be. You know, with um, with your head out of the box and to think very very creatively, and that's what we we tell our team all the time. You know, if you find a problem, let's say, you know, that's it. I got to the end of my knowledge limitation and so on. We always find a way to source knowledge wherever it is and to to kind of make it make it happen. And I can say that we did that with that type of spirit. We did that. Uh, we came to to that particular product in a very short span of time. You know, usually you talk about almost ten years to bring a medical device to the market. We actually we actually did that in about three three and a half years, and that's something which is uh, only considered to the you know to the way that we we push the envelope all the time. So. That's that's uh, that's exciting. Uh, clearly, you have a, an incredible market to uh, to tap, and uh, looking forward to just following the progress. Any any questions for Amir uh, about healthcare, Israel, the company? Feel free to send them on the chat. Um, any final thoughts before we move on to the next speaker, Amir? Um, not, not, uh, not really. Yeah. Know, Let me ask you something, another question. What, what are the biggest opportunities, uh, that you, uh, you would like help with, uh, in, in global markets? You know, we have uh, attendees here from various countries. Well, we, we would like, we would like obviously exposure. We would like to, uh, um, uh, 
basically basically uh, provide provide the message the message across so there is a these are technologies that will uh, will enable better point of care or basically democratization of health it's a big it's a big term but but we really uh, have to do it uh, bit by bit you know so we need we need access we need network we need uh, we need, uh more more exposure um, so uh, yeah. connections in the healthcare industry okay Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in the network, in the healthcare industry, in the investment uh, community, obviously, people that understand how to to invest in this type of uh, this type of environment is not necessarily the same as investing in software, but it's uh, it's something that is very can be very useful for. Thank you so much, Amir. Um, I can I can answer the question of Aaron. You know that like you know we can't. Uh, we can't. We can't predict. Predicting cancer is a big. Uh, is a big thing. You know, it's like uh, first of all, it depends. It really depends which uh, which uh, which cancer. But like you know, one thing that you can uh, have a look with uh, with our product is like cases of uh, of leukemia further down the line because you can see uh, morphology of the of the of the cells and you can actually see what happens in your in your blood. So, so, so yes, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of applications that I can talk about them uh, separately. Thank you so much. We'll get back to that in, in the breakouts uh, uh, in just okay. a few minutes. Thank you, Asha. So our next uh, speaker and company to present is B4P Research. They're actually my neighbor here in Zichron. Uh, we're sitting in the same building right now in the same office building. Um, and funnily, this, this is, uh, I, I noticed while we were speaking that most of us have uh, some, some accent, but uh, we have an actual Israeli who spent his entire life in Israel. So uh, it goes back to the immigration, uh, you know, uh, culture that we, you know, it's a country of immigrants. Um, and Aviv is, uh, is a CEO of B4P, he's a veteran uh, uh, army uh, lieutenant and commander. Um, and uh, what he's doing is, is really fascinating, uh, helping companies uh, make smart decisions about tenders. I'll have him uh, introduce himself and the company. Aviv, all yours. Thank you very much, Asher. Thank you, thank you everybody. So um, my name is Aviv. I, I retired uh, after 26 years in the military. I'm a retired colonel, uh, combat commander, infantry. Uh, having said that, I formed the startup. Uh, so um, a little bit about my background. Uh, after 26 years in the military, I retired in 2015. Uh, while I was in the military, uh, I had the pleasure of being a, a liaison officer at the US TRADOC, training and doctrine command uh, in Virginia. Um, and after I retired, uh, I, I had the chance of leading a G2G government to government project as a, as a freelance uh, between the Israeli government and the UN in Central African Republic. Um, in 2016, the uh, Secretary General of the UN uh, announced that the Israeli uh, pilot project in Central African Republic was a game changing regarding technology in the UN. Um, and after that, I, bet I, I formed uh, my company, uh, which is a group of two companies and our business is, is winning projects and programs basically in the UN and the World Bank. Um, the first company is B4P Research, which is a decision-making a SaaS a BI a, a program that enabled the user to uh, get access to a decision, a decision making uh, information regarding a certain tender and the probability of winning that tender. Uh, just to give you in a nutshell, um, and I won't talk about, about B4P a lot, but um, uh, usually takes a uh, company to make a decision of the first bid, no bid, uh, between five to 12 days uh, to estimate their, their chances of winning the tenders and 
so uh, we are uh, we did the, uh, our uh, analysis and we provide all those information for the decision making uh, process within no more than six hours. So think about it. Uh, nowadays, making smart decision fast is a uh, is a way to uh, maximize your business. Uh, and, and we pinched that point and decided uh, this is uh, this is the uh, the uh, the most important thing in uh, decision making. Um, so this is the, the startup uh, B4P Research. Another company is the uh, AR, which is an operational uh, company. Which basically I did I uh, I formed two companies that are. Uh, the base of what I love to do is uh, decision making and operations. So combining those two, making smart decisions, uh, uh, relying on on solid information, and then operating those are two things that they, that I love to do, and this is what I do. Um, B4P is a startup. Uh, we formed B4P after two years of uh, of. Um, of learning the business and developing the SaaS program. We formed B4P in 2019 and we got over, uh, we're handling over uh, 200 customers uh, since then. Uh, we had some major successes, uh, large companies in Israel won UN tenders with our services uh, in the field of, uh, of uh, homeland security, uh, agriculture, education and so on and so on. Um, from, your perspective, yes. from your perspective as a, as a military you know, veteran, do you feel that all those years in the, in the military is, has improved your ability to become a, a CEO in, in a startup uh, environment? Or yes and no. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying, uh, while I was in, in uh, as a liaison officer at the U.S. Trade Up, uh, I worked under General Dempsey, and uh, he sent me uh, uh, to uh, participate in some exercise of the 101st uh, Division. And when I came back, he told he asked me how was it, and I asked him, "Do you want me to tell you in uh, English or in Israeli English?" He laughed and said Israeli. So I'm going to answer that question in Israeli English. Uh, so my answer is yes and no. Um, no, because uh, after a long period of time in um, in, 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 in hierarchy or organization, um, you do not compete on your product with other uh, armies in Israel. So. So uh, you don't have to sell anything. You don't need to buy anything. Everything is being done for you. So in this case, uh, being on the private mar market as CEO is a disadvantage because you don't have the right tools. You, you didn't sell anything to, to nobody. And the yes answer is that you have uh, the tools and I won't go over them again, for decision making, risk taking, analyzing the risk, uh, making uh, programs and scenarios, what what will happen if, and because this is in your DNA, so um, I can I can share that that, that transforming from a colonel to a, a private in the in the private market. It's, uh, it's uh, challenging uh, and even uh, your skin hurts uh, to make that change. Uh, but when you make that change and you use those tools and you uh, take advantage of those tools and you understand that you cannot copy paste for, from a big organization like the military and you need to adjust, I think once you understand that, uh, uh, this idea and you embrace the capabilities of, of, of what the military have, have provided for you, you can be a, a pretty good CEO. I'm not saying that I am, but, uh, but uh, for, 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 for most of us, it gives us the very uh, good tools uh, to, to be a, a better CEOs. 
Um, my 10 cents to this uh, uh, discussion is two words, um, agile and interoperability. Uh, agile is a way of life. And once you embrace this, uh, this uh, um, uh, way of life being agile, uh, and adding to what Amir said, you know, you take no for an answer uh, and you need to change and you, and you understand that, that you need to change every time. This is a great tool uh, for Israeli startups and companies to, 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 to be a, success, a successful one. Interoperability, this is a term from the communication uh, area, but interoperability, it's the, uh, the ability to connect and reconnect to uh, different uh, disciplines in order to achieve your goal. So you're not focused uh, on I'm doing just that and I'm gonna take people just from that you know, um, um, area of interest, but I can, I can connect to other disciplines with other knowledge in order to maximize uh, my chances of what I call winning, okay? So, uh, so agile and interoperabilities are key factors in the way I think we live and that gives us a better chance of, of winning and achieving our goals. Excellent comments, thank you so much. Any questions for Aviv or Mark, should we move on to the breakout? <clears throat> Mark, can we move on to the breakout at this stage? Yeah, I think with this group, I think we just, let's just go around, keep it here. Go around, yeah. And let people introduce themselves in, uh, you know, 20, 30 seconds, you know, and, and maybe they're interested as it relates to Israel. You know, I see, for example, well, Aaron, you're on camera, so maybe you could, you could start. Uh, sure. Um, Aaron Winkler, uh, Chicago-based entrepreneur, uh, reforming a parent company in either Abu Dhabi or Dubai in the next couple of weeks. Um, two, working on two things, highly synergistic. One is a health insurance product, but the second and the one that I'm is driving me towards Israel the most is uh, a. Uh, uh, a crowdfunding style platform that creates royalty-based financing or similarly similar to royalty-based financing products for, uh, for startups and businesses, any stage really uh, would be fine. Uh, my goals are to avoid SEC regulations so that accredited and unaccredited investors can both participate. So that's why I'm concerned about and interested in the regulatory framework as well. Thanks. And oh, so you were the one who asked the regulatory question. Yeah. Well, it's it's a lot more lax than the U.S. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm not an expert uh, other than that, but uh, I can I can assure you that um, in private markets, at least, things are are less uh, stringent. Okay. I've long heard about the phenomenal development of the tech ecosystem there. So uh, since this is a, since our goal is to help non-US companies raise money from non-US investors, Israel had always kind of been my target first place that I wanted to start recruiting, so to speak. And so we're just hitting that, that stage now. Interesting. Thanks. Um, who's going next? Scott? Andrew? Yeah, I'm happy to go next as I have to jump off at 1.30 for a call, but um, nice to see everybody here. This is uh, an event that I've been looking forward to for a while, and so thanks for putting it together, Mark. Um, you know, we have a, a boutique marketing consulting firm in the New York area, but we do have clients and business in Israel as well as throughout the U.S., um, and I've long been fascinated by the growth um, in uh, tech in, in Israel, um, particularly in areas like biotech and, and uh, uh, health science, as well as cybersecurity. Um, we do currently have several clients there, primarily in um, financial technology and cybersecurity. 
um, that are Israel-based companies um, and are looking to do more work with companies there. So looking forward to networking and talking to each of you if possible. Excellent. Looking forward to it as well. Um, who wants to go next? I'm going to go uh, with the order that I see here on the screen. So, uh, Andrew, you're on. Yeah, I'm a recent um, participant in 361. Um, I've got a history on Wall Street, involved with some startups. I actually um, and currently work in business development in the technology realm in the SaaS space. Uh, but I'm a private investor, and that's really the reason why. And I've always had an interest in Israel and uh, the ecosystem there uh, from a number of different perspectives. So this is just kind of general interest for me and glad to be a part of the such a vibrant group. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Do you have any questions for the panel? Just if you, if you do, just uh, let us know. I, I will. I signed on late, admittedly. So um, I'm catching up a little bit. Sorry, guys. Okay, sounds good. Um, Anne Mooney? How about George? Oh, the aura. Okay, sorry about that. I was on mute. <clears throat> Go for uh, it. Okay, so hi, everybody. Uh, found this really fascinating. I'm Cincinnati based. Uh, my name is Ann Mooney. Uh, I'm in Cincinnati. Uh, wear a bunch of hats in addition to the ball cap that I'm donning today. Um, uh, perhaps that's symbolic. Um, one of the things I do is I'm a member of the Queen City Angels Angel Investing Fund and Group. And so I'm curious, I'm always thinking about deal flow on behalf of the group. And I'm wondering how we can tap into create a, a bridge between Israel and Cincinnati, Ohio. It's a great question. Um, Moshe or Alicia, you wanna, wanna respond to that? I'll, I'll take, a, you know, I think there are, there are several ways to do it. I think I'll share. You know, there, there. You know, was involved with um, you know companies like Our Crowd, which, which look to, which look to create um, deal flow for, for high net worth individuals and for angels. I think there are also opportunities to invest in new funds in Israel that I'm sure Usher can 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 help you uh, find and identify. And there are also some new platforms out there. That are you know whether it's um, is it moon phase or some uh, I mean, um, there there are a bunch of new platforms out there that are looking to bridge. But you know from my perspective, I you know if you someone were to ask me how best to do it, I very much believe that investing is a local business, and I think it's best to find a group or several groups that you identify with in terms of what their risk uh, reward or that you profile looks like or that you connect with um, you like how they communicate and feel comfortable uh, giving them um, capital to work with and then obviously don't give it all one day you know spread it out and if if that relationship works maybe you know, double down going forward. But I, I think it's important to find a local partner because investing from remote or even re investing, you know, I've, I've got good things to say about, you know, some platforms that give you the chance to pick which companies to invest in. I tend to believe that it's better to pick managers that are close to the businesses that they're investing in and they take an active approach. I would want to add to that that it's probably wise to target the sectors where you know Ohio industries can can be most relevant. Um, so I'm not sure you know what 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 you know what the economy looks like locally and what industries are flourishing, but but especially if you have uh, connections to multinationals or to customers where you can add value to to a certain sector within uh, the startup ecosystem in Israel it'd be much more likely to want to come over and, you know, meet everybody and, and, and you know, partner and take investment from local investors and, and even open up an office uh, in that local uh, region. So that's, that's an important aspect when you, when you think about 
how to get deal flow, you, when you really want to talk to the startups that need your, your local relationships. And what we did uh, also, we have created co-investment vehicle. And this is where we are working that for the people uh, with the LPs or with anyone who wants to be involved in different sectors that in different uh, stages. So the co-investment vehicles are always attractive. So I give you an illustration, for example, if I invested in 20 companies from different uh, sectors, it might be in the Ohio, you are interested only in the smart mobility or only in FinTech. And then according to your needs, that will be that in the co-investment vehicle. So you, will, you might cherry pick and you can be that much, much more involved in the deal flow that has been invested in the funds. So uh, today, uh, more and more VCs are doing that this in order that to give the flexibility uh, to the LPs and to be more involved in the sectors that they are investing. Great. And I'm happy to uh, also connect you with, with some of the, you know, with everybody on the panel and, and, and beyond. Uh, we'd love to get you more involved and your group involved in Israel. So let's continue this. Yeah, uh, sure. do, okay, next, uh, Michael Hammer, you're available. Uh, yes, I am. Um, sure. So I'm just, I have a general interest. I actually had hoped to make it out to Cyber Week, um, had a conflict. Lots of friends uh, who are founders uh, in the cybersecurity space in Israel. Um, so really, I'm just listening in out of general interest. Um, nothing specific. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Nishat Kaswani. Uh, Is there anyone else who didn't go? Um, looking at the names, I think everybody had a chance to introduce themselves. Asher, I have a general question. May I pose go it? Ahead. Mm -hmm. um, many, many US churches that I'm familiar with are, are ardent supporters of Israel. Um, and I don't know anything about investments that they make, whether they be churches or Christian um, humanitarian entities. Is there an effort on behalf of some of these companies that are presenting today or in general to reach out to, um, to the churches, I guess, of America, for lack of a, a better way of putting it, to elicit interest in these companies? But Andrew, isn't it? That that more is that really investment or is that more is that cause or philanthropic oriented? Yeah, the answer is I don't know. Uh, it's it's really a, a broad based question. I, I'm well, not I aware that it is a lot of uh, <clears throat> delegations that come to Israel definitely before COVID. Not sure about the rate of, uh, of you know delegations of visiting, but there there's usually um, some a day or two where they visit and, and hear from from technology companies um, and uh, explore you know ways they can get involved i'm not sure they you know that these churches invest in, in early stage risky type of uh, venture capital uh, opportunities but um, from an impact perspective i think that a lot of them are very interested in supporting Israeli companies, uh, especially in, you know when they're when they go public or when they when they're mature, um, and they often have companies come and speak at their local you know community centers about Israeli innovation. Uh, I know I have done that in the past, uh, traveling to Israel to to the states, and um, I think we would all welcome these relationships. Uh, you know, there's there's. Uh, Definitely a, a synergetic, um, you know, in terms of our relationships with the U.S. in general, there's there's constant flow of, of uh, as I said, delegations and, and and different organizations that try to support. But if there's any particular connections that you you can offer, I think um, we would all welcome mm -hmm. it. 
Thank you. Do we have uh, Nish Nishanta on, la on the line? I'm not sure if he's still here. Did everybody uh, have a chance to introduce themselves? If not, this is a good time because we're about to conclude this, this section and, and just uh, uh, move on to uh, the conclusion. So, um, Mark, how, would you want to would you want to close the uh, the session? I think the biggest takeaway is that there's uh, a lot of new new opportunities for for Israel to uh, to continue to innovate, to continue to make a difference in in the sectors that Israel excels at, whether it's cybersecurity or ag tech. Uh, water, uh, you know, fintech, healthcare, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of problems that still need to be solved. And uh, although it's a challenging uh, environment to raise capital, uh, one thing is for sure is that this will pass and, and many, most VCs have a long-term view in, in their investment uh, strategy and, and, and horizon. So they're thinking, you know, way past uh, the near term, they're thinking what what's going to be successful in five, ten years, um, and and they focus on the you know on the great companies. So while the good companies were able to raise capital in the in the last couple of years when it was cheap, uh, it's good. The, the bar has raised has been raised, and now the great companies are going to get funded. Um, and historically, we know that even in down in down markets, uh, some some of the biggest successes have, have you know have uh, were born uh we look at um, airbnb and linkedin and there's tremendous uh data on that um so overall i i remain very optimistic um and i think israel is well positioned to continue to grow and mature from uh you know what what the the phrase in the past was startup nation now it's scale up nation but i think at the end of the day um you know, there's still a lot of work to do. So uh, we we need to continue these conversations and, and connect the community uh, and, and support each other. Um, I think this will bring the session to, to an end. Thank you everybody for joining. I know Mark has a uh, um, schedule of events coming up that he wanted to uh, review. I'm not sure if Mark's still on. Um, but you can all you can all see it on the website on the 361 firm. And if there's any final comments or thoughts or questions before we we close up here from the panel panelists or attendees, or takeaways conclusions. I hope uh, this was. Uh, I'd ask a lot of questions, but I miss I missed too much of this, and I, which is a shame. I had to run back and forth. Probably. But I, some, I'm, I'm afraid of repeating what Anne may have asked, or I'm very curious on Michael. But I'll, uh, I'll, re I'll watch the recording. The main thing is, yeah, to let people know that this is, uh, these are all stepping stones. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark, for putting this together. Uh, you're doing really phenomenal things with the community, and I look forward to continue doing uh, more, more of these sessions in the future. Thank you, Asher. Thanks, everyone here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.